Well, it's Dr. Ken with you again. We're back to electromagnetism, lesson number C7, and it's DC generator excitement. And it's not the kind of excitement you get at a theme park, but a different kind of excitement in a generator. So what we're doing in this particular lesson, so although uh, a fellow by the name of Michael Faraday discovered the principles of electromagnetic induction way back in 1831, it took a long time, 40 years, before a commercially available DC generator was developed. It took them a lot of years to decide and work out how magnetism, and particularly how electromagnetism, worked. So in this lesson, we're going to look at how each of the generators performs when provided in power to a load. There are a couple of different arrangements for the generators. We're going to look at some of the applications and the limitations of each generator. They're, they've each got their pluses and minuses or their advantages and disadvantages. If you're following along in the textbook, which I always suggest is a good idea, uh, this is chapter 13.4, 13.5 and 13.6. A separately excited DC generator, a self-excited DC generator, and a little bit of information around doing calculations around DC generators. So first up, separately excited at DC generator. The magnetic field current is separately excited to a DC generator, providing by an external DC supply. So we've got to get our DC for our rotating, for our, not our rotating magnetic field, sorry, for our fixed field from somewhere else. The DC supply can be adjustable or it can be a fixed supply voltage connected in series with variable resistors or these days electronic switching circuits to control the value of the field current because if we control the value of the field current we each control how much magnetic flux there is across the generator which affects how much we can actually generate or what voltage we're generating at. The DC supply can come from another generator of some kind that is uh, mechanically connected to the main generator shaft and sometimes that happens, just depends on the situation and the context. So here's our basic generator. So let's actually start in the center and work our way out. So here's our shaft. In the center, this is the bit we're going to put a mechanical prime mover on and we're going to drive the generator around. Then the next segment out here, this is the commutator. So we're looking end on to our commutator. Then on the commutator itself, connecting, or the, the, the commutator connects, of course, to the armature. So this is our armature out here. And then we have brushes which connect the armature winding by the commutator to the outside world. So here we go to the outside world. So there's the armature. But the bit we're interested in is the excitation of the field, the field windings. So here they are, field field windings in brackets N for, there's a, so many turns. And this one's been wound to make the top one the North Pole and the bottom one the South Pole. So what are we gonna have? Once we energize this field, with electrical current in this direction through the field windings then down into here into the field windings and then back out to whatever DC supply happens to be externally provided for the operation of the field. I'm just quickly drawing a battery to make it easy. The result will be magnetic flux 
running north to south across our armature space. So that's what we're going to get all the way across here. We're simply going to get lots and lots and lots of flux for our armature to cut. And as the armature is turned around by the prime mover, it cuts the field. We're going to provide a voltage here at the armature and which will allow current to flow if we were to connect this to some kind of load. I'll just draw the load as a resistor for now. The load can be all kinds of things. So there's your basic operation of your two pole separately excited DC generator. So here it is in circuit diagram form, but we've added a little bit extra stuff. So again, here's our armature being driven around a shaft by a prime mover of some kind and our armature supply going out. Again, I'll just draw a resistor to represent the load pretty wonky resistor. Our field winding hasn't changed. It's just in the mechanics of the generator, it's split up into two parts. There's a north part and a south part, and they're just connected together electrically. But here we've added a field rheostat, and rheostat is just another name for a variable resistor. And again, here's our DC supply. Again, I'll just quickly draw a battery to represent that. And if we have a resistor in series, therefore we can vary the amount of current that flows through the inductor. Therefore, we can control how much magnetic field there is going to be across where the armature is spinning. So this is going to give us the ability to actually determine what the voltage out will be by controlling the field current through this field rheostat or variable resistor. So here's an equivalent circuit. So we had a look at the mechanical device, then we had a look at the connection diagram. Now this is the equivalent, equivalent electrical circuit. I'll start on the left hand side with the DC supply, rheostat, magnetic field, which basically is just a dirty big resistor itself. And again, we can just simply manage the amount of current by adjusting the rheostat or the variable resistor backwards and forwards. That part, pretty obvious, hasn't changed. But what is different is we have a generator and it's like a battery. So we're using this battery symbol here called EG, the the voltage or the energy, the electrical energy being generated, EG. So the EG has this DC battery and effect, but also because it's actually made up of copper wire in a coil, it actually has some internal resistance. So we have RA, which is the resistance of the armature. So our armature in total, which is the red dotted area, has a device that looks like a battery creating a voltage, but in series with that voltage we also have an internal resistor called RA. They're not separate things, they're all integrated because it's just basically, if you remember on the previous drawing, our armature is just a coil of wire 
coming back through some brushes because it's spinning back out to the real world to connect to some kind of load but because this is an inductor it simply looks like a resistor connected in series with a battery so that's the equivalent circuit a resistor connected in series with a battery so that gives you the equivalent circuit but of course all of this is happening because we have this huge magnetic field across here between the field windings and the armature that's spinning within the field So let's now we understand the basics of how the generator works. We've looked at it as a physical generator, as a connection diagram, and now as an equivalent circuit diagram. Let's look at the open circuit characteristics of our generator. When there's no load connected to the generator, its terminal voltage, VT, will equal the EMF, the electromagnetic force, generated in the armature, which is the value of EG. And the value of this voltage depends on the following. Right, the strength of the magnetic field created by the field coils. If you have a strong magnetic field, you're going to get higher voltages. If you have a lower magnetic field, you'll have lower voltages. So the strength of the magnetic field, the number of lines of flux in effect. Two, the number of armature conductors connected in series, which depends on the construction of the armature and how it's wound. So how many coils of wire are wound around the armature and are spinning inside that magnetic field? So the number of armature conductors, in other words, the number of turns that are on the armature. Three, the relative speed of the moving conductors through the magnetic field. So again, if we're moving the conductors slowly through the magnetic field, we'll end up with a small voltage. If we spin the conductors quickly through the magnetic field, we'll end up with a much higher voltage. So field strength, number of turns on the armature, and the relative speed, or the way the conductors are spinning through the magnetic field, will determine the EMF, or we abbreviate that to the EG, the voltage generated. So the equation to find EG is P phi NZ on 60A. So let's, let's find out what each of those things is. EG is the voltage generated at the armature. So our E subscript G, voltage generated at the armature. The P is the number of poles. That's the number of poles on the armature. Phi is the flux per pole in Webers. So how many Webers have we got going through? How many lines of flux are there? How quickly is it spinning revolutions per minute, RPM? Z is the number of effective armature conductors. A is the number of parallel paths in the armature. Again, how the armature itself is wired. Before we go on, the 60. The 60 is simply so we can have RPMs. It's just a conversion factor for RPM. That's all that is. The 60 is simply put in there as a constant which allows us to work in revolutions per minute rather than revolutions per second. So let's have a look at a quick example 
A lap wound armature in a four pole generator has 200 conductors that are effectively in the magnetic field. The flux is 0 0.06 Webers and the armature is being rotated at 800 RPM. What's the value of the magnetic voltage generated at the armature? So P, they've told us, is 4. The phi is 0 0.06. The N is 800. Z, we've got 200 effective conductors in the magnetic field at any one time. A is 4 as the number of parallel paths that you've got in a lap wound armature and the number of brushes which equals the number of poles. So if you want to know how many poles you've got, look at how many brushes you've got. That also tells you that. So what is EG? We come down to our standard formula here of EG equals P phi NZ divided by 60A. So again, we just put the data in, four poles, 0 0.06 Webers, 800 RPM, 200 effective conductors, our constant of 60, so we can work in RPMs, and then our four, which is the number of poles, because that's the number of brushes we have, and the fact that it was, we told that it was lap wound. So when we do the maths, it simply comes out at 160 volts. Example 2, a DC generator has an effective field flux of 500 Webers and is rotated at a speed of 400 RPM. The machine is constant at 5. Find the voltage generated by the armature. So again, in this particular case, our formula is phi nk. So we're going to have 0.05 Webers, 400 RPM, and our k, our constant, is 5. So it's just a shortcut version of the previous formula, and we, in this case we get an eg of a hundred volts. So if we want to test and set up, this is how we would go about it. So the circuit for determining the generator's DC open circuit characteristics, in which the speed is held constant for the values of current output voltage are measured. So we're not going to have much current, are we? Only current into the field. So effectively, we're going to have various amounts of field current. We're just going to have open circuit voltage, simply measuring it with a voltmeter. So at a certain current, so it's simply going to be I in the field winding, I'll call it IS, versus the voltage out at the armature. I'll just call that volts A for armature. So again, we've got DC supply. We've got lots and lots of flux across here. And the flux is going to vary depending on the current. So as we vary the current here, we're simply going to measure the variation in the voltage. That's how the test works. So this is the circuit for that characteristic. And here's the curve that results. So we have flux density here on the horizontal, which is the relationship of the amount of current. So the amount of flux density was simply equates to the amount of current we had going through the field winding and the magnetic force H or our amp turn meters. So it's simply the HB curve. So the open circuit voltage obviously as the 
flux increases, so the voltage and the amount of magnetic field that can be carried, but it gets a point where it doesn't matter how much extra current you put in, the field saturates because you've only got a limited amount of iron in your generator. So saturation occurs up here because there's just a limited amount of iron. And the result is this one over here. So the volt goes up in this direction as the field current increases in this direction. And again, you can see here, saturation occurs at the same place. Can't get the voltage any higher because you can't get the field current to do any more work because you simply run out of iron. So the generator's open circuit voltage with increasing field current, but the RPM kept constant. Okay, we've kept the constant RPM. So the only thing we've varied here is the actual numbers or the amount of lines of flux across the generator. It's the only thing we vary. By varying the current to the field, we've varied the amount of flux. That's the only thing we've done. And it's simply made the voltage go up straight line until we've run out of iron and the whole thing saturates and you can't get the voltage any higher. So now we're doing the exact, oh, well not the exact opposite, but now we're going to hold the field fixed and we're going to change the speed. So here you can see generator output voltage increasing in this direction and our speed increasing in this direction and the line is the volts response. So the volts responds in a beautiful straight line compared to the RPM. So there we have the voltage versus the speed for a DC generator at no load and the field the field current has been held constant. That's very, very important. In this one, we held the field constant, but we varied the speed. In the previous one, we held the speed constant and varied the field. So what about load characteristics that's no load characteristics so a generator is used to provide electrical power to a load it's therefore useful to know the generator and how it performs under load conditions so the last two sets of curves told us how it performs with no load so this is done using a load test in which the generator is run at its rated speed and its rated field while the load current is varied. So we actually change the load and see how it responds. So here we have a variable load. Let's have a look first at the setup. So all this part over here remains constant. I here, I for the field, is simply set at its max. Its normal maximum. We rotate the armature here at its normal RPM. But we, what we are going to do is we're going to have a load. This is effectively a variable resistor. And we're going to wear, vary this backwards and forwards. We're going to measure the current in the load and we're going to measure the voltage across the load. So that'll tell us obviously how much current is being provided, what's happening to the voltage, and of course if we were to multiply those two together, we would end up with the amount of power being put out of the machine. So under this test, 
The generator terminal voltage is measured at different values of load current. So it's the load current we're varying with our variable resistor here for constant RPM and constant field current. So this is what the curve looks like. Here's our volts on the left hand side and our load current on the horizontal. And you can see the dotted line here. This is the rated output voltage. And here at this point, the rated current. So as there's very little load here, the load's very small, I load, very small, so I'll just write small. We're a little bit above the rated voltage. But as the load increases, so we're getting bigger here, so we're getting bigger. And as the load continues to increase, until we hit the maximum load point here, and at the maximum load point, we actually hit the rated volts. But note what happens if we increase the load beyond. So we get our load out here and go beyond. You'll notice our terminal volts drops down. It goes below rated volts. So drops below. So terminal voltage drops. So we start high. As we approach the rated load, we hit the right spot for the rated voltage of the generator. If we go above our rated current, then the voltage at the terminals begins to drop and it will continue to drop. So the next thing we need to talk about is a thing called armature reaction. So armature reaction causes the machine's magnetic field to twist in the direction of rotation. Because we've got a magnetic field, obviously across here, as we spin across here, we create current flowing through our conductors on this side towards us, away from us on this side, but this creates another pole of magnetic field. So we get a secondary magnetic field. And we know that like poles attract, and we get this distortion of the magnetic field. As the two magnetic fields interact with each other, we end up with this distortion and it's called exactly that it's called armature reaction and it just twists the magnetic field which means it's not quite cutting the field at 90 degrees it's cutting it at something less you can see here if you put a dotted line so quite often what they'll do to overcome this is they will actually move the armature on the, sorry, the brush on the armature. They'll actually move them physically a little bit to allow for this armature reaction. So little trick for beginners with generators. If the brushes don't look as though they're exactly across the center of the generator, it's because they're allowing for this thing called armature reaction and the magnetic field is being twisted by the way the magnetic fields interact with each other as the machine rotates. So what are the effects um, of armature reaction? It uh, causes the flux to concentrate at the trailing pole tips and reduces at the leading pole tips. The magnetic flux can be disturbed unevenly. As a result, the magnetic circuit in the machine is not being used effectively or efficiently, and the generated voltage is reduced a little. 
sparking at the brushes, which can reduce be reduced by moving the brushes to new position. As I mentioned, you can move the brushes and it reduces the sparking. The sparking just wears the commutator and the brushes down unnecessarily. So if you can avoid sparking caused by armature reaction, you'll make the armature and the brushes last much longer. If you've ever played with uh, model motors and things in uh, racing cars, boats or aeroplanes and you've used brush type, you would have noticed little sparking at the commutator and uh, that's because of armature reaction. But of course in a toy motor there's nowhere in there enough room to be able to move the brushes around so you just have to live with it. So again, we're here we're talking about uh, brush position. Brushes are positions, so they're switching between the commutator segments. And we want the switching to occur at a neutral zone. Again, it reduces that sparking. Then there's no current flowing when the coils actually do their switching. So if you can position your brushes so they are at magnetic neutral zones, you won't get that sparking effect. Quite often we use a thing called interpoles. Um, I'm not sure you've heard of Interpol, which is the International Police, but that's not the kind of Interpol we're talking about here. So here's our field, and you can see here, here's our field north and our field south. And of course, this is producing magnetic fields running across here. But in large generators, we've got a bit of spare space, so they add these things called interpoles. So we actually end up with a north pole that covers this amount of space, and a south pole that covers this amount of space. Making the machine far more efficient. So interpoles reduce the effects of armature reaction, because your field is a lot different. I'll just can clear that. So if this is our new pole arrangement which operates across here, just quickly draw them in for you. We're now going to get a magnetic field that looks far more like this. And we're going to pretty well eliminate armature reaction because we've got magnetic field all the way across the machine, not just vertically through the machine. So what about self-excited generators? That was an ex externally excited generator. So most DC generators are self-excited. Only the really big ones are externally excited which means they provide their own field current. There are various ways that this can be done and each method is named after the manner in which the coils are connected. So they can be in series with the armature. They can be in parallel with the armature called shunt or a combination of both. So there's three types. There's series generator, a parallel generator, and a combination generator, which they call a compound generator. So combined is called compound. So in our shunt generator, you can see here, here's the generator, and the field winding, as you can see here, the field winding, field north, field south, is simply connected in parallel with the armature. So here's my armature, here's my armature connections, and then here's my field, simply connected in parallel. So the shunt connected DC generator has its field winding in parallel with the armature and therefore the output terminals. So a little bit of the current generated in the armature 
gets fed from the armature up into the field which produces some flux which then produces some more voltage which produces some more current which produces some more flux which then produces some more voltage which produces some more current again can you see where I'm going and that produces some more flux so on and so forth until the magnetic fields are saturated and that's how it works but it requires there to be residual magnetism already in the machine so control X there we are there we are so we need a tiny little bit of residual magnetism left in the machine to start to build the magnetic field. It only takes a few seconds, but you need a little bit of residual magnetism across the field, and then a little bit of voltage generates a little bit of current, and then the current just keeps building and building and building and building until the generator is up and running, and you've got lots and lots and lots of flux and the armature itself is providing current to the load and it's providing all this current to the field. So that's called a shunt generator. So the load characteristics for a shunt generator look like this and you might expect that here's the standard curve we saw on our previous generator. Once we reach full load then as the load gets past full load, the voltage drops off. And if you overload it, the speed drops back and the voltage at the terminal keeps slowing down and down and down and down and down and down and down, and down until it stops. So this is why it wraps back on itself. It works well. So here it is using the fluxes building, the fluxes building, fluxes building. And then everything's cool as long as we stay here. But if you overload the generator, the generator slowly starts to slow down physically until it stalls, it's called, or stops. And we end up here. So here's our circuit diagram. Our armature providing current to the load out through here, but it's also providing current to the armature and we can put a field rheostat in if we want to control that field amount of current as well. So voltage against speed. On this characteristic, here's our speed across the bottom. RPMs and voltage vertically. So in here is a critical speed because we're, we're kind of building up that magnetic flux. And then when we hit a critical spot at the, just the right amount of RPMs, there's our operating point. So there's our operating speed there through the curve. If we try to go beyond that, if we try to create, push the RPMs up, it comes to a point where eventually the voltage will start to pull back and die again. So the voltage produced by a shunt generator varies almost proportionally to its speed of rotation once the critical speed has been achieved. In other words, once we get to critical speed, we end up with almost a straight line for the performance of the machine. So here is a series generator. So let's look at the connections here. Here's the motor terminals. This is our load. And we've got current through the field, down through the field, then through the armature, through the armature windings, back out to that and into the load. So the load, the armature, and the field are all in series with each other, hence we call it a series generator. A 
load characteristic pretty straightforward here's the terminal voltage here on this scale and here's our load we just keep increasing the load current once we hit rated load or rated current output we get rated voltage so if you run this at any other than rated load you're not going to get the appropriate voltage out of it so that's one of the downsides of a series operated generator you can see it's nice and linear but you're not going to get rated voltage until you've hit rated current because as you can see here our load our field etc are all in series with each other you can control the current in the field by putting a variable resistor or a rheostat in parallel across therefore you can deviate some of the current around the field and not use it so series generator big thing to remember is they're cheap they're nasty and they're not going to give you full voltage out until you've got full current out voltage against speed characteristic so our rpms in this direction and our voltage here again it's close to linear but not perfectly linear a slight curve as the rpms increase you get up to rated voltage but you've also remember got to also achieve rated current so if you haven't also achieved rated current at rated rpm you will not get rated volts up here so the compound generator kind of mixes the best of both worlds together so we've got a combination of series and parallel and you can see here here's our field top and bottom again and we come off one connection and through the field and we've got another leg of the field another part of the field is also tapped off and connected in series and pops out here so you've got your field coils have got a parallel component and a series component in them might be a little bit more obvious here on the drawing so let's have a close examination of this we'll start here with uh, a compound generator the reason they call it long shunt is because this shunt or this parallel path is all the way across the generator so as you can see we've got a field component here in parallel but we've also got a field component here in series with the armature on B you can see we've got a short shunt here's our series component Here's our parallel component and it's in shunt but our shunt is shorted to cross to here so they call this the short shunt so it's still in parallel it's still a shunt but it's shunted in as it were a little bit earlier rather than going in here it's the only difference slightly different place to connect the shunt again each has its own advantages and disadvantages so different types of compound generator there's the level compound the number of turns in series of the coils keeps the generator's terminal voltage almost constant 
from no load to full load. So that's one of the big advantages of the compound. So it doesn't matter whether you're fully load, part load or full load, you're going to get a fixed voltage at the terminals. Over compound has more turns in series coils causing the load voltage to rise above the no load. So if you've got a heavy load or a load that varies a lot, sometimes that can be an advantage. Under compound has less turns in the series coils causing the terminal voltage to fall under. So again, that one's better for lighter loads. Differential compound in which the series coils oppose in magnetic field, so they're the opposite way around connected as far as the magnetic field is concerned. And again, it produces good solid terminal voltage consistency. So you can see here on the graph the different types of compound generators and what they do. So on the vertical, we've got the terminal volts in this direction. And on the horizontal, we've got the current, the load amps. And the dotted lines show us the rated current and the rated voltages. So the red dotted line here, rated current, red dotted line up here, rated voltage. So let's quickly look at the first one, the over compound. You can see the voltage just continues to rise slightly. So if you've got a load that's very heavy and doesn't mind a little bit of over voltage, then tick, tick, that can be an advantage. The level compound, as its name implies, are very level. Doesn't matter what the load is, light or heavy, it's pretty well got the same voltage all the way through it. The under compound, much better for very light loads, its voltage drops away quite quickly as it comes down as we reach the rated current. And then finally the differential compound, only good for very, very, very light loads because it will eventually stall and come to a stop down here. So you can see the curve gives you the advantages and demonstrates how you can use each type of generator. So that brings us to the end of Electromagnetism Lesson 7. Hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about different kinds of generators or DC generators and how they work.